طلعنا من سوريا لانه يعني انقصفوا صارت تضرب الطياره يعني بسدني يعني اتلم اتلمت لاني ما عاد شغله ما عاد توازينه بدنا نطلع خلاص. فقدت بابا بعد بسنتين ما تركت بيتي. كانت الحياة مأساوية كثير بالنسبة لنا. Hello and uh, welcome to today's uh, FP virtual dialogue. This is a uh, special event to mark the launch of Foreign Policy's newest podcast, Syria's Lost Generation. My name is Dan Efron. I'm Foreign Policy's executive editor for news and podcasts. Uh, and it is my pleasure to be your host this afternoon. Our latest podcast series is a collaboration with World Vision International and with the Syrian American Medical Association Foundation, uh, that is SAMS for short. And uh, this is a podcast that we dropped the first episode uh, last week. It's a six episode podcast. Uh, if you have not had a chance to listen, I encourage you to check it out after this event. I'm gonna show some bias here uh, because I was uh, among the team members who worked on this show. Uh, it is, I think, one of the most interesting projects I've had the pleasure uh, to work on. Pleasure is a, an odd word given just how uh, devastating and how complicated the war has been over the past uh, 10 years. Over the next hour, we're going to hear from some of the podcast's protagonists uh, and also from other frontline voices about the harsh realities going on in Syria as a result of the conflict. We're also going to hear some voices of resilience and hope, and you will hear some of those uh, on the podcast as well. So thank you for tuning in. I'm going to start by thanking World Vision and SAMS for uh, making this project possible. And before we get started, um, we want to hear from you, our audience. We have many hundreds of people tuned in here on Zoom. Uh, we have other people watching our live stream on social media. We've reserved a portion of this event for questions from our global audience. So here's what you need to do. If you're on Zoom, click on the Q&A button below and submit your questions. Please be sure to tell us your name and where you're writing from. We'd like to hear that. If you're joining us on the phone or you're watching live stream, you have an option to submit questions as, as well. You can do it by email. The address is events at foreignpolicy.com. And of course, we encourage you to chime in on social media, but uh, be sure to use the hashtag Syria's Lost Generation podcast. Syria's Lost Generation podcast, uh, no apostrophe, also Syria 10. Okay, so uh, we're gonna get started. I'm delighted to introduce our first set of speakers, two field representatives, one from SAMS and the other from uh, World Vision they are gonna help us understand the real impact of the war, uh, mainly on young people in Syria or uh, in neighboring countries. So let me introduce them. Rami Shama uh, is World Vision's Lebanon Operations Director. And Dr. Farida Al-Muslim from SAM uh, is an OBGYN doctor. She was one of the last remaining female obstetricians uh, in Aleppo in besieged uh, Eastern Aleppo. Um, Dr. Farida, I want to start with you because um, your story is very interesting. You're a doctor, you worked in hospitals uh, during the war, and I want to get a sense for just very briefly, what was your life like in Aleppo before 2011? And then how did it change uh, once the war started? Thank you. 
I was born in Aleppo City and I started my study at medical school in Aleppo City and my life I think was perfect. I had everything. I had a, a daughter. I had a house and then I started in a private clinic where I was working with men, with women because I'm OBGYN and and suddenly everything was changed at 2011 and my life was changed. I, I chose to help people in my area, which uh, was under rebel control area. And I start to be with, especially with women and children because there were no doctors all, uh, in that area. They were a uh, short of doctors. They, they left that area, the Eastern area of Aleppo city. So the area, there were no doctors and I chose to stay. And I was under, under pressure because I was the only one with a lot of patients every day. So I was under pressure, but, but I was happy during that days because I was helping people, saving lives. I wanna ask you about the conditions in the hospitals where you've worked. I've heard you talk about uh, barrel bombs that fell on hospitals. Also a barrel bomb that fell near your home, one that hit the school where your daughter went to school. But maybe let's focus on the hospitals. What were the conditions working in the hospitals, treating patients, treating people who were wounded uh, in the middle of uh, this uh, devastating war? That was during that time to be, to be focused on a patient and where the blame is around you, just over your head, just targeting your hospital, to be focused and to be just to, to stay calm with your patients, that was the hardest step. And especially under the siege, that was so bad because all the people were full of negative energy. All the people were crying all the day, just saying we will be killed, the, the regime will take us. But we were trying, me and my friends, like midwives and nurses, we were trying to be positive, to fill the, air, the, the environment with a negative energy, to be laughing all the, all the time. But we're trying, but, but sometimes we fail to do that. There were no supplies during the war, during the, the siege. There were no medical staff, not enough medical. And I remember at the last month, there were no midwives at all. Not even one midwife. So I start to to teach the, the nurse, the male nurses to be midwives, to help women during their deliveries. Because um, myself alone, I can't do everything. So I start to teach them, some, some of male med, uh, nurses to do their work with women during their deliveries, to help them. Because many times there were women came, came to the hospital, they find no one to help them. No one during the delivery. And I remember one day in, in the hospital, there were a, a chlorine gas attack and the woman was in her labor and she needed a cesarean and we didn't know what to do because all of us were suffocating because of the chlorine gas attack. And so we have to move to another hospital. And that day was horrible because I witnessed in the street, there were a lot of fires, a lot of people, dead people on the ground everywhere and no one cares take that the people from the from the streets that was awful during that time uh, sometimes Dr. we we needed a, a, sur a general surgeon and all the general surgeons were busy all the time because they were working 24 hours seven days a week they they, they, they were no no day off so where the, all of them were busy and sometimes i needed a doctor and the doctor had to move from a room, from operation room to another operation room to help me. Sometimes I did the, something alone without anyone. That, so that was very hard days, but I felt, but I was, to be honest with you, I, I was happy. Me with my friends, we were happy because we were helping people because we, we knew that we were working for God's sake so we were so happy during that time. You know, I want to pick up on that and ask you, as a doctor, surely there were opportunities to leave Aleppo or even to leave 
Syria, um, and you chose to stay, I think, until you no longer had a choice. I know you're now displaced, you're no longer in Aleppo, but can you describe that decision, whether to stay, whether to leave? You had a daughter um, you were talking about uh, who was uh, quite young when the war started. To leave my country was a really hard decision. It was not easy. We thought about it for a few months and then the COVID come and we didn't know what to do. And then the bombardment start again in last February and my daughter start to see nightmares again. And she said, no, no more bombardment. I can't bear it anymore. So we, we were thinking about just to move to Turkey or just to live in another area in that uh, Turkish controlled area. We thought about just to live there, but it's the same because there were also an explosions every, maybe every week or every two weeks. So the area is also is not safe. So we choose to, to move to the US, but, but it was not really an easy decision to take and now sometimes I feel I regret my decision because in Syria, I, I was saving lives. I had to work, I had a job. I, sometimes I have a moment of happiness, but not happiness. You can say that I had a life there and, but my daughter was not happy. She didn't have a school because the schools in Edlev was full with people, with displaced people. There, the schools were, was not enough for all children. So my daughter was one of that children. So she, they, she said, I want school. I want to be in school. And the schools were not enough. And also the area in Edlev, there were no infrastructure. There were no electricity, no clean water. And I, I myself uh, was living there and and it's hard to be there, to live there. Three times when I was in my house, there were a poisonous fume in my house due to the warming up, which was not safe ways to warm up the house. So three times there were a fire and there were fumes in my house. And my daughter was crying many times. What is this? What's happening in this house? There were no bombardment, but, but what is this? I told her this is the way that we have to warm ourselves up. But even though I was lucky more than the people who are living in the tents, they can't warm, their, warm their, themselves up. So we took the decision after a while of hesitating, saying no. My daughter said, I want to see my family again, but we didn't have the choice. We didn't, we didn't have the choice. She wants to, to see her grandfather, grandmother, but she can and uh, my, my, and also I, I can't see my family in Aleppo city. Even Aleppo city and Idlib are so close, but I can't see them. Rami, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, king over to you on the issue that uh, you were describing, Dr. Dr. Farida, of leaving, of being in other places, of being a refugee. Rami, you're the Lebanon operations director for World Vision, which uh, in Lebanon, uh, which means that you are. Uh, you know, probably have as much experience with Syrian refugee crisis as just about uh, anyone. Lebanon is the, uh, is the epicenter. Um, and so I want to ask you to describe what is your routine? What is a regular day for you in terms of inter your interactions with refugees, the things you see, the kinds of issues that get raised that uh, you go about taking care of? Yes, Dan. Let me start by saying that uh, when we talk about 10 years, uh, it's, you know, a decade. A decade is a very heavy word uh, to describe a conflict that's happening. Being from a country that went through a 16-year 16, 16 civil war, I can uh, totally relate first on a personal level because, uh, you know, when Dr. Farida was, was talking about her experience, I always remember the stories that my parents used to tell me that they used to move houses uh, every two, three weeks during the civil war in, in Lebanon. And we were living in a hot zone next to a Palestinian camp in the south. But I have to say that, that 10 years uh, of the conflict in Syria, uh, it represents the greatest humanitarian failure uh, of our time that we can ever think of. 
doing uh, for every single child affected directly or indirectly. When I was listening to Dr. Farida's, uh, uh, you know, story about her child, about her daughter, I could not think, I could not but only think about my, my own children. You know, I have two boys. And honestly, with the things that are happening in the country now, it's very similar. I hear their stories most of the time telling me why are we hearing bombs? Why are we hearing conflicts? Why are those people carrying guns? Why are we seeing all of this? So I would say that within my field experience, every time I speak to refugees, I speak to uh, Syrian or Lebanese children, uh, they are asking for very simple things, a safe place to live in, you know, uh, education, some care, making sure that their parents have the minimum that they can uh, meet their needs. And honestly speaking, if I want to describe this period, I would say that it is a devastating history, a disruptive present, and a torn future. This is how I would describe uh, the routine that we are living in currently with four crises present in the country. Nine out of 10 uh, Syrian refugees are under the poverty, uh, under extreme poverty. We're talking about more than uh, half of the children who are not going to education. So if I want to describe the daily routine, I would say that there is this whole negative energy that Dr. Farida was talking about. But I remember one time, one person who told me that we as humanitarians, we are doomed to be optimistic. So we have to search for those stories that provide us with hope. Uh uh, I'm just going to explain to uh, our viewers, you know, Lebanon and Jordan, uh, bordering countries for Syria. These are the countries where many, many Syrian refugees have streamed into. I think it's uh, more than a million refugees in uh, Lebanon, in a country with a relatively uh, small population. And I want to ask, you alluded to this, you know, Lebanon has its own share of, of uh, problems you know, the, the refugees notwithstanding, there is a virtual economic collapse in recent months, um, a, a kind of a chronic uh, political problem uh, all the time. There is COVID-19, which Lebanon is dealing with just uh, as uh, every other country uh, deals with it. Um, as, a, as a humanitarian worker who is trying to bring uh, some aid to uh, refugees, um, maybe you can talk about some of the challenges that those other issues present in your work. Well, definitely those crises on top of each other will uh, create a very uh, complex situation. And one time one person told me, if you think that you understand uh, Lebanon's context, it means that somebody has explained it to you wrong. And whenever we go into the, uh, the field, we actually see lots of complexities, starting from infrastructure complexities to people's tensions that are arising because of the situation that they are living in. Uh, I think one of the most highlights that I can relate and everybody can relate to is the levels of stress that those families are living by. It is being cascaded towards their children. And here I always want to go back to the impact that this, uh, this crisis, specifically the Syrian crisis, has actually had on children. You know, uh, it's very well known that children always have this positivity in their lives until they are in this continuous loop of negative energy. And this is where they would start having their dreams crushed. You know, I would uh, talk about one story actually, uh, when, uh, when I was on the field a few, week, a few months ago, actually, uh, and uh, I met this family, they had two boys uh, and she was one of the teachers in our programs. Uh, that we do the early childhood education for, for uh, Syrian refugees. She actually had two boys. Uh, one is seven and one is five. The exact same age as my children. And I asked uh, the oldest one, his name is Taim. And uh, I told him, what do you love uh, about life in general? Because I always like to hear these stories from, uh, from young children. And he told me, I love school. So I told him, why do you love school? He said, because I go to learn. And I said, okay, so why do you want to learn? He said, because I want to become a doctor. And I said, great, 
I'm thrilled by your answer, but why would you want to become a doctor? He said, because when I go with my mom to the pediat ped pediatrician, the children's doctor, and I see those children and some of those families don't have even 30,000 Lebanese pounds to pay to be able to uh, get this checkup on these children. I want to become a doctor so that I can uh, check on children for free. And this was his answer. And I told him, listen, time, I'm going to do something that I haven't done before. I'm going to post the story or part of the story on Twitter. And I'm going to tag you. I'm going to put your picture. And I'm going to, and this picture will be a reminder for you to continue dreaming and continue looking forward to achieving this goal in your life so that you can actually uh, do this. And in the evening, I remember that day very uh, vividly. In the evening, his mom created a Twitter account under his name. And uh, they even continue contacting me and communicating with me even until this day. But this shows how much hope we really have uh, with those children. Okay, you mentioned hope. I was gonna come back and ask you about that, but you told a, a story that um, certainly resonates uh, based on the kinds of reporting we've been doing for this podcast. In other words, these are very difficult stories, but there is also a resilience among these refugees in Lebanon and in Jordan and elsewhere that uh, is really remarkable. And it, it, uh, it comes out in the interactions with them uh, in the interviews that we did. Um, we're gonna stop there for this panel. Um, and um, I'm gonna thank you both, uh, Rami and uh, Dr. Farida. Uh, we're gonna bring you back to the screen at the end uh, for an audience Q&A. So, uh, audience members are already sending in questions. I'm looking at them stream up my phone here. Um, we will get to you guys. Um, uh, but for now, we're going to say goodbye to you and we're going to welcome to the program our next speaker, uh, a Syrian activist and award winning filmmaker Wad Al Khatib. Uh, Wad documented the horrors of Aleppo for Channel 4 News in a series titled Inside Aleppo, which received an international Emmy for breaking news coverage. Wad's first feature documentary, For Sama, documented her life over five years in Aleppo. It also garnered numerous awards. And uh, Sama, by the way, is the name of Wad's daughter who was born uh, during the war. Um, and I will just say uh, that the documentary, if you haven't seen For Sama, um, that's the other thing you should do as soon as you get off this call. It is an incredible work of uh, filmmaking. And I should say just an incredible work of uh, humanity. So Wad Al-Khatib, thank you for joining us. Before we start our conversation, um, let's just take a, uh, a quick look at the trailer for Sama. Uh, and uh, uh, for those of you who have not seen the film, you'll get a little sample of what it's like. بحلب مدينتي سريان لسه عم صور هذا الشيء اللي عم بيخلي معنا لوجودي ما حدا منا كان عنده اي فكره كيف رح تتغير حياتنا للابد Sama, 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 Sama,
بيضرب كثير اليوم سما انا بعرف انك عم تفهمي شو عم بصير بقدر شوف هالشي بعيونك ما عم تبكي مثل اي طفل عادي هذا الشيء اللي عم يحرق قلبي سما رح تسامحيني Okay. Um, do we have uh, Wad on the call? Yes, I'm here. Hello. Hi, Hi Wad. Uh, it's a real pleasure to uh, to meet you. I introduced you just before um, that trailer, um, and uh, the film is incredibly moving. You are, I suppose, uh, an accidental journalist. Um, you moved to uh, Aleppo to study. Was it economics? Yeah. Yeah. Marketing economics. Okay, I want to ask you, um, how did this start? Uh, at some point, um, you, you take up a camera and you just start filming everything around you. Maybe you can explain how that happened. Yeah, I mean, before this, I just want to say, like, I'm very honored to speak up after Dr. Dr. Farida, uh, who I was lucky, like, not really, like, a lot to meet her a lot, but I met her once at her house uh, with my husband, Hamza, and her husband, too. And she's like a very famous doctor in Aleppo. And she was like part of uh, the hope that we can have as like people who are living there, uh, part of the safety also. Um, I mean, I, I was pregnant that, in that uh, time. And just to know that there is like uh, a doctor who's doing her best to help women, that was like a very important uh, part of our resilience. So thank you for her and for all the amazing work that she and all the other doctors in Aleppo have done. Uh, I mean, to go back to where I was before, um, I was uh, a third uh, year uh, in my university in Aleppo, uh, at Aleppo University. I was just studying there um, and the revolution was something we might like not expect, but it's something like deeply in our hearts. We wanted and we felt it at the same time. Um, I was watching a lot what was happening in Egypt, Tunisia, um, and Libya. And we were just like kind of questioning ourselves all the time if that would happen in Syria or not. And when we start hearing about that in Syria, I remember exactly the first time was one of my friends and she was like a really good friend of mine. She was in Damascus and I start to know like that she was part of uh, the people who are organizing a demonstration in, in Damascus. Um, in Aleppo, it was a little bit like uh, after a uh, like couple of weeks when it started uh, in uh, in the campus of the university and then start like to explode it uh, in like everywhere at the university and then in some neighborhoods in, in Aleppo. And at that time, I mean, I've never had a camera. I don't know how to film. Um, we also like as a kind of community, we're scared of cameras or of being recorded or of being like uh, reported because we know like how the regime was using all of this material before uh, for their own um, like benefit. And we start to like kind of used to the camera through that time. We start to feel that this is the most important things we can do as activists to prove to uh, ourselves, to the our families, our friends, the Syrian people, and then the world that this is the truth of what's happening in Syria because the regime was shutting down everything. You know, the, the scenes in the film of uh, Aleppo, of the destruction in Aleppo are, are just devastating. Really, they look like uh, films that depict, uh, you know, the, the Europe in World War II. That was the thing it reminded me of. Um, and, you know, we have seen scenes like this from Syria for much of the, back, of the past decade. And yet I have to say there is a, a level of indifference to the war there among governments, among even informed people. 
Um, there's certainly war fatigue. I think that's part of the issue, but I'm wondering if you can explain, if you have a, some understanding of why that is. I mean, why that is, it's quite simple as much as it seems complicated, but like we didn't of course expect that the regime would use this like level of violence. But we bear a warned a lot from before from our parents, from the older generation, that the regime will stop at nothing to crush the Syrian people, to crush the revolution, to crush anyone who could stand. And we start to see that very early in the demonstration when they start arresting people in the street, beating people to death, uh, shooting them like in very direct way. And like I've I've been in that situation when just like the guy who was next to my shoulder was like beaten like in his head and I saw the blood and I saw everything and just because he started chanting like with three words um so I mean that was kind of like a sign and we 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 should have expected like what more but literally every level of violence we were thinking that you know like what 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 more and we we were thinking that this is the worst thing could happen and then we start to see like chemical weapons so, so many different like level of weapons, um, aircrafts, then the Russian intervene came. And like, I would say, although all of these things we, we, we've seen and we knew that this, this is like the worst thing could happen, what, 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 they, what he could do more of, the, of this. But also like, then we, we were in that position when we were besieged and we saw other cities who were besieged for five years. Um, we were kind of lucky enough that decision in Aleppo was just for six months. But also we didn't even like kind of expect, expect, expect the worst, which is the displacement. We were feeling that even at that moment, and I understand so much what Dr. Farida was talking about, about being happy, about being, maybe happy is not the right word, but satisfied about being there and trying to do anything. And as much as we were scared, as much as we were like panic about everything was happening, but there was a level of satisfying, a level that we are taking this responsibility and trying to do something for us, for our children, for the whole community, as everyone else in that community. But then to be in that position when we had to, like there's no option but to leave. And I think that was for me like the most worst like feeling ever because I was okay to live there under the shelling and the bombing with my daughter, as many like as as much as like three hundred thousand people people were in the siege of Aleppo, and we were okay with that because we wanted to keep fighting. We don't have women as individuals, but we have so much things to do. Any doctor who ha like who ha who brings so much hope and uh, like uh, serving the people in that position. Me as a filmmaker, so many other people who were carrying cameras. Everyone like like no matter what is your role was, even if it's too small, even if it's too big, we were all together as one community trying to stand and keep our fight like going. And then to be in that position when like even this one, like they kind of like took it out from us, it was something like so difficult. And then now, like we look now at 10 years, I mean, I, I don't know where we can bring hope, but I can feel hope, I can see that. I can see that from the people who, we're protesting yesterday and today in Idlib, like thousands of people who you feel like a month ago were like, where are these people and what, how they like kind of lost everything. But then you, you look at them, how they stand to say just one message that they are still alive. We're still alive. We're still dreaming. We still have like that passionate about having a free country and we need to keep this fight forever. Yeah, that commitment to uh, to staying and that that feeling that you're describing, I think, comes out um, more than any other part of the film. When you guys, I think you um, you leave for a, a trip to Turkey to visit a, a relative, um, and the situation in Aleppo escalates, and you have to make a decision whether to stay or go back, and you end up going back uh, partially on foot through war zones in a very dangerous area. Um, there were moments where I watched that and I just thought um, this must have been the scariest moment of your life. You and your husband are taking turns uh, carrying Sama, uh, your daughter. Can you talk about that decision? To what extent did you have uh, you know, differences of opinion between you, second thoughts, the feeling along the way that maybe this was a mistake? Yeah, I mean, it's very weird. And I feel also like 
I should not tell people this like very, very clear um, like answer, but we didn't thought about it a lot. We didn't like hesitate about it. Like the decision for us was just like to look into, into our eyes and say like, yeah, for sure we know that we have to, to be there. The, maybe the second thought was about having someone with us or not. And also like this, this one wasn't something like easy. Yeah, like to take that, okay, I will leave just my daughter in safe place and go to a place I don't know if I'm gonna go back or not I don't know if I'm gonna like stay there for one month six months five years and that's like was something helped a lot like you know to kind of like take this this decision to kind of like go back and like stay there Aleppo was a city full of civilians full of children it wasn't just like someone who we we gonna like take her and go to a front line or um, kind of like a war zone where just like fighters. Um, if you watch for Sama, and I really would love everyone to watch it, like you can see how many children in the city. Like Aleppo was a very very like uh, like a city full of families and full of children. And what happened that the regime was attacking neighboring neighborhoods where like community and civilians were living there. So it was like not easy to decision, of course, but at the same time, it was like, that's what we should do. Um, and I think like also now Dr. Farida, who just spoke before me, she had also a daughter and she was in that situation. There was so many other families. It wasn't just like about us. And we weren't just like, you know, like the heroes who did that. The city was full of children and full of families, and we we had just to do what we have to do, and it's our duty. Wada, I want to ask you briefly, um, and this is must be something that occupies your thoughts every day. Can you imagine a, a scenario, a situation where you can go back to Syria? I mean, I it's very difficult. If I want to really be honest, and if we're going to talk about reality, it's something. I don't want to even like think about. I always keep this like small window for me where I always like imagine and think and hope and even see that happening. And I mean, as much as I'm very like desperate and disappointed and feeling like frustrated about everything happened in Syria, as much as I really see this day every morning and I don't know like how naive we are or how strong we are. I don't know what is even the right word. But I really believe that like it doesn't matter how much it will take, but one day I will see that day. And that's what keep me alive. That's what I what keep me like until today able like to speak about that experience, to work toward that day. And again, like it's not just about me. Like who am I to like lose hope or stop like fighting? There's so many people today who's like still living in camps. I'm in a safe place now, but these people are not. And for them, I should not like lose this small thing that I can catch, which, which is hope. Um, there's over 130,000 civilians and people who are detainees, uh, who are detained in Assad prisons. For all of these people, we have like to keep working every day because in the day when they will be released, the day when they will get out, they have to see us keep going. We should not forget not for them, not for all the people who we lost from the peaceful demonstration 10 years until today. Uh, I mean, there's a huge amount of young and um, like older people who we lost and they were like a treasures in, in Syria. And for all of these people, we should not forget, we should not forgive and we should, we should keep going to the end of this road. Okay, Wad, Wad Al-Khatib, thank you very much. I'm gonna let you go thank and you, we're gonna you. move on to our next segment. Um, and I'm gonna urge our, uh, our viewers, our listeners to, uh, to watch for Sama. It's, uh, it's a, a remarkable documentary. Um, now we have a, uh, a transition here. We're gonna, uh, we have a brief segment with the award-winning actor, Liam Cunningham. Um, the, Liam uh, is uh, an Irish actor. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting him several times over Zoom in the last few months because he participated in our podcast as the host. He appeared in Game of Thrones uh, and many other uh, shows and films. He is also a World Vision ambassador. Uh, and as I say, most importantly, the host of Syria's Lost Generation. Um, and I'm just gonna say a, a word or two about what we're um, gonna see. It's a four minute, five minute video. We were able to 
sit down virtually with Liam and Hussam al-Haraki, uh, who is a, a Syrian refugee. Um, uh, he's a young man who fled Syria with his family as a teenager. He now lives in Germany. Liam first got to know Hussam in Jordan years ago um, and has kept in touch uh, with Hussam. We're gonna see Hussam talking to Liam about how Hussam fled uh, Germany, uh, how Hussam fled Syria, excuse me, with his family um, and the kind of ordeal it involved. Um, it was a uh, dangerous and complicated ordeal. It involved hiring a smuggler, walking through the desert for 70 kilometers, uh, getting shelled along the way, having to leave um, one of the group members behind, um, even having to think at some point to weigh whether to kill the smuggler uh, in order to survive. So uh, what you're gonna see is Hussam in conversation with Liam describing one particular part of that journey. Because I was like in the front of the group, I was the youngest. So I had this backpack, I throw it away. So I was like really the quickest. And um, at, at some point I was walking and this woman walked to me and say, please, please, Hussam, please take this, take my child. So just carry my child. I see you are just fit and you can walk. I can't walk anymore. Uh, anymore. So I was like, it's a child. It's a responsibility. I can't, I can't carry this child. So when this, when these mothers are saying to you, please take my child and make sure my child gets the safety. They're saying this because they think they are going to die in the desert and they want their children to live. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're 14 at this stage, yeah? I was 14. So I took the child. I took, I took the child, yeah. And I, I watched the mother the whole time. If she walks, I walk. If she doesn't walk, I stay because... You can't imagine this, this is not your baby, not your child. So, um, and and she had like a backpack. So I told the women, please throw your backpack away because it's um not realistic. So you can't walk yourself. She said this is the food of the child, the baby. This is the milk and and uh, and and the, the the bunch of other things. Yeah. So I, I told her you have to throw this away. She said, oh, "No, I'm not throwing this away. You, you, please carry my 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 child, my baby, and 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 I carry the bag." I did it. I did it like for 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 seven kilometers, and I couldn't anymore. So I I I I I, I went to the to, to the woman and and told her, um, "Can I, I I give your baby to to someone else, to, to someone else?" So I went to the, to my brother, my older brother Ahmed, and and I gave him the baby. My Ahmed, my, my brother, was like really. Shocked, hey, well, what do you want? What this is it's not our baby, it's not our baby, man. So I was like, it's the baby of this woman, let's just follow her the whole time. And we just changed. So, from your life of going to school, you are now having to t think about, and your family is having to think about murdering people to stay alive. Uh, uh, uh and people in your group are having to think about leaving their parents in the desert, um, murdering children to keep quiet so you won't be spotted by military and, and, and shelled. And I mean, these are, for a 14-year-old boy and all the other young kids and parents that are there, these are, this, the stress, the, it's appalling that families would have to go through this and you don't even know if you're going to yeah. die from lack of water, lack of food, shelling, um, the sun. Uh, I mean, it's it's a it's a, a terrible journey, isn't it, Azam? I think people, normal human beings, they just forget bad things. When bad things happen, these human beings they just um, uh, try to forget about the the bad things. Yeah. Try to get on with your life and see the good things in your life. Exactly. So, um, as I'm telling you, in 2021, now um, I had to go to my mother and ask her about the details of, 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 of this journey. Yeah. Because I really forgot about it. I like not you every buried detail. It. Yeah. I just I just burned it in my mind. I just want I don't want to um talk about it. I don't want to think about it. 
because it was as miserable as I'm talking to you, as as I'm I'm telling you. That's the classic sy symptoms of PTSD, isn't it? It's cl that's classic post. It's it's post traumatic stress disorder is where you, for want of a better, well, you try and compartmentalize the place it somewhere that you don't have to deal with it because it's horrific. But what happens is it comes out at some stage. It's a it's a dreadful, dreadful thing. It's 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 a mental health issue. It's it's appalling. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Okay, a big thanks to uh, to Liam and Hussam. A big thanks to both of them for their contribution to this uh, podcast um, and to this event. And you'll hear. Uh, more of Hussam's story in uh, episode six. Liam sits down with him for a chunk of time and, and uh, interviews uh, Hussam and gets him to talk about uh, not just leaving uh, Syria, but uh, uh, being a refugee in Jordan and then eventually finding his way to Germany. So now let's proceed with our next conversation. I'm delighted to be joined by Andrew Morley, who is World Vision International's president and uh, CEO, uh, and also Dr. Maher Azuz, who is the chairperson of SAMS. We're gonna spend a few minutes talking about, new about how humanitarian groups go about helping Syria's refugees, and also about where the war is going now as it enters its 11th year. Uh, we'll also talk about the findings of World Vision's cost of war report. So welcome to the program. Andrew and Maher. Hi, Andrew. I'm going to start with you uh, since I see you there uh, on the screen. Thank you uh, for coming on. Um, you know, I, I want to uh, ask, first of all, about, um, you know, the, the organization you run, World Vision, looks after refugees, uh, not just in Syria, but uh, elsewhere. Syria is unusual. It's unusual in terms of both uh, the sheer devastation but also just how long this war has been going on. And I imagine that creates uh, its own problems for humanitarian work. There is emotional overload for people doing that work. There is trauma for people in the field. There's, I imagine, a donor fatigue. Am I zeroing in on something? And if so, uh, maybe you can talk about how you cope with all those things. Yes, thank you. And um, thank you for the opportunity to join you today. Uh, I was, I was, I've got to say to start with, I was really deeply moved by seeing the four, some I hadn't seen that before. So Wired El Khatib, that, that was just a beautiful piece of work. And um, I was, uh, I, yeah, I was, I was in tears when I saw just the brief, the brief clip. And it just brings to life what the situation really is like on the ground. And we find ourselves trying to tell the story of the need to often to people, uh, be them institutional donors or individual donors, that just aren't that interested. They, um, they, you know, they see more glamorous um, causes and easier to um, easier to respond to causes. But this is just—it's really difficult to get people to listen. That's the first thing, and. Um, but we have at World Vision. We have a commitment to to go to the um, most vulnerable children in the most difficult places. So um, we find that many of our peers decide not to do work in, in Syria, particularly Northwest Syria, because it's really difficult. You know, border crossings are closing, access to basic medical um, supplies is, is lacking, and we'll hear that more from um, Dr. Maher, but the, it, it's tough. But just the scale of difference that we can make by being there is phenomenal. So um, we hear that 600,000 um, people, um, including many, many children, over 50,000 children have been killed. But, but telling the stories of people whose lives are being changed and where we're bringing hope is, is how, we, how we are cutting through when we can use numbers and we can use statistics you know, the vast numbers that we can help and support with a relatively small budget. Um, but it's stories of individuals that really cut through. I want to ask you, um, what is the uh, international community uh, doing well or what does it do well when it comes to 
uh, helping Syrian refugees and helping try to bring an end to the war in Syria? And where does it fall short? And you know, um, we talk about the international community almost as a monolith, but really when we say that, uh, you know, I think we're talking about the countries with resources, the countries that are able to help. Uh, maybe you can describe what are some of the challenges of harnessing some of that? Yeah, well, the, the first challenge is, is that the, the absolute level of resources available to do the work that needs doing is wildly insufficient. And, you know, we, we estimate that, uh, that it can be as little as 10% of the funding that's needed to respond to the immediate needs. This is not long-term development. This is responding to humanitarian needs today on the ground. Um, is so the resources are sorely lacking. So um, you know we call on all parties to to really look at this as something that well we have a a need. We have a calling. We have a you know we have a God-given duty to respond to people who are in in need often through no fault of their own. So, um, so the first thing is, the first challenge is that the absolute resources available are too small. And the second challenge is that there, there, are, political, um, there, there are political influences everywhere you go in Syria. There are political influences in border countries, there are political influences on the ground. And so um, anything that you try to do is just very complex more complex than probably anywhere else that we operate. And we operate in a hundred countries. And so it's navigating that complexity just needs the, the will and the commitment of the international community to come together and to bring peace, be it a temporary peace. We, we pray and hope for a lasting peace, but, but that can only be possible through uh, political cooperation and people laying down agendas because people are suffering in ways that are basically inhuman. We talked to, we referenced uh, World Vision's uh, cost of war report um, in my introductory remarks. Um, it's been 10 years, the war is not over. I think people think of uh, the war in Syria as winding down, uh, but it still goes on and uh, certainly in pockets of, uh, of the country. And you know the numbers that we do think about a lot, I think the, the numbers that we journalists bandy about are how many were killed, how many are refugees and so on. But the impact of the war manifests itself in, in other ways and other numbers. Maybe you can talk a little bit about this, you know, whether it's mental health issues, whether it's uh, homelessness, poverty inside Syria, outside Syria. Maybe talk to me a little bit about the report. Yeah, well, one of the, one of the, one of the reasons I feel um, personally particularly called to context like this, and our organization does, is because of the, you know, the one, the need, but two, the ability to make a difference. And um, even using conservative estimates, we, we help support 600,000 people uh, each month there on the ground and through partners, um, and you'll hear from from Sam's and Dr. Maher um, uh, later, but but we are we're able to make a big difference with relatively small amounts of money because the need is so great that actually you you can invest a relatively small amount and make a big big difference, and and so it's it's always knowing that um, that we can keep we can keep hope alive. And I I had a conversation uh, just last week with I try to speak to people on the ground because um, I used to spend my life two weeks a month traveling to places like this and last this time last year I was I was in that in in that region just before the lockdown but now my world is instead trying to connect and encourage and learn from people on the ground and I spoke to Dr. Um, Jamil Devil, Dr. Jamil Devil, who um, he works in the main children's hospital in Idlib and he himself is an internally displaced person. And one doctor um, talked about um, um, 20, 30 children that he can save. He personally can, can save, save lives each day. So just by being able to support him on the ground, the, the difference that can be made is, is incredible. And the one thing, and it was really interesting to hear, um, really interesting to hear from Wad 
uh, Khatib and, and some of the other speakers, this idea of hope, of all the contexts I've been to and all the places I've seen and worked in, this is probably the most complex and very often the most challenging, but it's a place where more than anywhere else I've been, the, the people on the ground are keeping hope alive. And so, um, and so despite the massive numbers and the massive numbers of displaced people and the fact that this is 10 years in and with no realistic short-term um, um, opportunity for, for complete resolution, you, the people are so hopeful. I don't know if it's something in the Syrian spirit, um, but it's just, it's so encouraging and so heartwarming to see. I would echo that um, based on the, the work that we've done and the interviews we've done. Uh, thank you, Andrew. I'm going to turn to Dr. Maher. And um, Dr. Maher, I want to I ask you, I, I have to say, um, I'm going to make a little confession. I did not know much about the work of SAMS um, before I started working on this podcast. Um, I know that you guys are a humanitarian organization um, that started well before the war, but that sometime after the war, one of the things that you guys do is raise money to build hospitals in Syria, but also send doctors uh, over to Syria to work in Aleppo, in other places to uh, treat the wounded, the sick uh, and the wounded. Um, I would imagine that the logistics of that alone must be incredibly complicated, not to mention the, the safety issues involved. You led some of, those issues, some of those missions to the region. And I wonder if you can describe something about one of them or a recent one, uh, something like that. Do we have Dr. Ma here with us? Sorry, I was unmuted by the host. Can you hear me? I hear you and I see okay. you, hello. Okay, <laughs> okay, you. good. Uh, so um, the, uh, um, Obviously, going back to what uh, what we do, um, Sam's uh, is a small player, obviously, but an important player. Um, we provide significant healthcare in uh, northwest uh, Syria, and throughout the conflict, we provided uh, with the aid. And that's where I want to take the chance uh, to focus on the positive in the beginning, since there will be a lot of negatives we can talk about from what you've uh, heard. Uh, but like what Andrew said, uh, even though what we do is little. But uh, it does help. And this is something that you learn as you do this. Uh, in uh, answer to your question, our support uh, is uh, relatively uh, diverse. The medical missions that we lead to the region or to uh, Syria uh, are a small part of obviously of what we do, but the big part is supporting the infrastructure, supporting the physicians like Dr. Farida who decided to stay, who feel their identity is with helping people on the ground, maintaining that capacity. Uh, if you keep healthcare facilities working, then people stay. You support with these missions, the, uh, the skills that are on the ground. Uh, I'm going to borrow from the most recent trip that was taken by the uh, uh, SAMS uh, president, Dr. Mufaddar Hamadi, who just came back actually from uh, Idlib. He uh, went on a visit with uh, three other uh, physicians uh, that went on a uh, trip. Uh, but uh, you know, everything is difficult, even just you know, the president going, trying to check on things. It's requiring uh, permits, uh, being able to keep things uh, secret, being able to have enough logistics people that will be able to secure your access. Uh, and still you're loaded with uncertainties whether you're going to be able to get to this facility, not being able to get to this uh, facility. There was bombing uh, the day before they got there, which could have changed this uh, so uh, those uncertainties for us when we're going on a day or a week to help, imagine the uncertainty that people are living. And that's what Dr. Mufaddal came back with. That's what everybody told him. Look, we don't mind dying. We don't mind going. The ones who died, those are the ones who are lucky. Those are the ones who, are, who know their fate. We cannot live with the uncertainty 10 years into the conflict. We need to plan the physical and mental impact of this uncertainty is crippling the population. And this has short-term, intermediate, and long-term impact on the ability of these individuals that are supposed to rebuild the system, but 
with this impact, with the negativity of the uncertainty, they're not gonna be active individuals that you can count on in building a healthy society in the future, not alone maintaining a healthy system currently. Um, you know, I'm going to um, pick up on that and ask you about uh, the, the brain drain in war situations, um, a situation where people who um, are most able to uh, help society, and we're talking in this case about doctors, uh, sometimes hospitals have been targeted, doctors have been targeted, um, doctors who've had opportunities to leave, um, some have left. Uh, some have been forced out. How, how do you deal with that kind of uh, uh, brain drain? And I, I assume that SAMS has training programs in Syria. Can you talk a little bit about that? So uh, when we talk about brain drain, uh, there are two aspects to this. Uh, the, the first aspect is the loss of healthcare capacity when it comes to staff. And this is not just doctors, we're talking about doctors, we're talking about accountants, we're talking about nurses, we're talking about facilitators. Uh, but more than that, it is whether the staff that remains as little as it is can perform their duties to the fullest when the expectations of, from them is way beyond what can be expected from one individual. Dr. Farida alluded to this. She described to you how a surgeon would be operating in a uh, facility. Uh, but even for us as SAM staff, and I'm sure Andrew will describe the same thing from his uh, perspective, uh, a year, two years, three years into the conflict doing this, not seeing a hint of positivity, not seeing a hint of hope, not seeing a hint of difference or a different future, uh, be it just trying to fight the despair, the inability for us, and we are miles away here, whether in the United States or in other parts of the world that are trying to help. But uh, we do get our strength and our resilience to continue from the staff that's on the ground. You heard Dr. Farida. She's missing being there. There is a joy in helping. There is a joy in feeling that you are making an impact. You're saving lives. Uh, eventually, you have to develop coping mechanisms that you have to know that they are healthy. And we at SAMS, we do have a few programs that we try and focus on. But the problem is uh, the, these programs or the access to provide these programs is very limited. But trying to, fa to fight burnout, trying to fight the despair, the, the feeling of inadequacy, the feeling of unimportance. One of the things that you hear from the people there when you go is that to the world, it seems that we are worth nothing. How long can the world watch us being killed, murdered, slaughtered, and not just this? Everything, every basic human right of health, food, shelter, water, education is being used against us and nobody seems to care. Our programs do focus on helping our staff, uh, helping the population into developing coping mechanisms that are healthy, that can build towards resilience rather than sometimes coping mechanisms that could be unhealthy. But uh, me personally, I had to go through that struggle years into the conflict, it was just very difficult for me to function. And I started feeling that I'm taking it out on the people around me, this sense of despair, this sense of helplessness. But then you learn how to do your work day by day. You don't look at long-term results. If at the end of the day, you felt that you've saved a life, you've helped in saving a life, that's pretty good. And then next day we start over. That took me a while. And I know that a lot of our staff would love to do this, could do this, we help them to do this. They just don't have the time when you're on the ground, when you are in a refugee camp or when you are in a hospital and not knowing whether you're gonna go back home or not for that night, that you have the luxury of listening to a lecture or to a training program or even have the ability to 
develop those coping skills. Uh, but we get that strength, believe it or not, for me, it was on one of these trips from the kids on the ground. Yes. The ones who have the least, the ones who have the least, yeah. they are the ones who give you the strength. Yeah. One look into the eyes of a kid, a smile of a kid that has nothing running around in the mud uh, is enough energy for us to keep doing this. Yeah. But the question now is, are we going to be sitting here 10 years from now discussing 20 years of the conflict? Or are we talking seriously about doing something different so that we are not sitting here 10 years from now or a year from now discussing the same thing? Yeah, um, I think that's a, that's a, a good question to, uh, to, to end on. I, I will just say that... Um, you know, one of the things I became exposed to um, in the process of working on this podcast was a story of one of your SAM volunteer doctors who talked about going over to Syria, working in a hospital, um, and it was being bombed while he was working there and not knowing how to respond and looking around at his Syrian colleagues, these doctors who quietly uh, and with dignity uh, just kept on working um, and uh, kept on uh, performing the surgery or treating patients or helping the wounded, um, and that he took his cue from them, from them. and understood that that's, um, uh, that's how the way, to, the, the way to comport yourself in these uh, situations. Um, I'm going to thank you both uh, very much, Dr. Maher and Andrew. This is a, a really uh, interesting uh, conversation. I'm afraid we're going to have to start wrapping up. We did promise to take um, some questions from our audience, and I want to give uh, everyone a chance to address some of those questions to the extent that we have time, and we're running short on time. So let me bring back um, our other panelists, uh, Rami and uh, Farida. Um, if you can join us, uh, Rami and Dr. Farida, on, uh, on camera, um, that would be lovely. I'm going to scroll through some questions, and I will tell you that... Um, one recurring theme is people asking um, how to help. Um, and I'll, I'll just read a couple of those. There's a question from Megan in Seattle. Seattle. She says, I heard on the podcast that it costs uh, about $40 to help a Syrian child access education uh, in Lebanon for a year. How can I contribute to that? Um, Andrew, maybe this is for you. Um, for people who are hearing this and want to help, is there... Uh, and these are individuals, these aren't corporations, these aren't governments. Um, is there a way, a mechanism for people to help? Yes, there is. And so the, 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 the statistic that it's $40 a year to educate a child in, in Syria is pretty phenomenal when you think about it. So it just shows how we can make a big difference with relatively small amounts of money there. We, we estimate that it's about 40 to $45 a month to give a child all they need, food, water, health care and education, $45 a month. And in all the countries where World Vision operates, we have programs which will allow you to um, donate that, um, that level of funds, which can then make such a difference on the ground. And, and largely our work in Syria is from individuals, individuals who have been moved by the stories that we heard from Wired Al Khatib and stories that we heard from, from Rami, from Maher and from Farida and just wanting to make a difference in one child's life. And, um, and that's a real blessing being able to do that and we can help make that happen. Um, thank you. Uh, there's a question from uh, Eduardo Nunes, um, and uh, he's addressing it to you, Andrew. Um, he's asking if we need a new Geneva Convention focused on children uh, to prevent these kinds of long-term, uh, you know, uh, losses to children in conflict. Is there a legal issue? Are there, does this need to be addressed in terms of international law and treaties? Uh, what can be done? Well, the Convention for the Rights of the Child is now 31 years old and has been signed by almost every country in the world and would cover most of the issues that we're seeing within Syria. For us, this is not about more legislation, more, um, more conventions. It's about a political will to see the change and to put down self-interest and to focus on humanitarian need. And so 
for us, particularly for children. And one of the, one of the stats that really struck me is that five million, five million children have been born in Syria over the last ten years. So they all this is all they've ever known. This is all for those five million children. Their whole life has been this, and so for them and for people who need it on the ground, it's a real political will to lay down individual um, agendas and to find a solution, a last, a, a an initial piece and then a lasting piece to 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 really make a difference. Uh, I will say that there are more questions about how to help, including if people can't give money, if there's some way to volunteer. Um, there's a, a person in Canada who is asking about, and Rami, maybe this is for you, um, Canada's sanctions prevent any transactions, uh, sending goods, including medicine or medical supplies to any firm or individual in Syria, um, unless there's a, a part of a diplomatic mission or an international charity. Um, what is the impact of these sanctions? Uh, especially on uh, medical facilities, particularly in more remote regions. Um, and I mentioned you, Rami, I'm not sure that uh, this was uh, particularly uh, directed at you or if, or if you would be the right person to answer this. So anyone on the call, uh, if you have uh, any insight on this. Yeah, I would, I would say just uh, Dan on, on this matter and uh, maybe someone else can actually also uh, pitch in. But the sanctions here uh, that, uh, uh, that the colleague is talking about is actually affecting not only Syria, but also Lebanon and other countries. Because it's not only even in-kind transactions, but even financial transactions. And that is true. I mean, what Andrew spoke about is that there are so many ways that people can actually help and support uh, through charities and through organizations, uh, through volunteering. Sometimes it's even uh, sending stories and sending videos to children who are present here in the country. Uh, if uh, people have, uh, you know, this kind of uh, link between uh, their country or their children and the children that are present here in, the, uh, in Lebanon or in Syria, this could also bring hope because I do remember that many times during the conflict in uh, in Lebanon, even different conflicts, there was this link between people or children outside the country and children who are inside the country, and this used to bring uh, to bring hope. I think one of the main uh, main things is that we would need to get what uh, children want, you know, and uh, this is something that we could help in as well as organizations, international be it or local organizations inside Syria or outside, uh, just letting people know uh, what children want and what children need. And I go back to my first, you know, last uh, sentence, it's a torn future. And I, uh, it's not accidentally that I chose this word because it is a torn future. It means that it can be re uh, uh, revived, it can be uh, uh, made better, it can be restored in one way or another. It's not a destroyed one. It's always, uh, there is always a way that we can actually bring, uh, bring this back. Okay, we're going to end there on that note. Um, and I want to say uh, thank you to all of you. This has been a, an incredibly interesting uh, and insightful conversation. Um, uh, all of you, it's been a pleasure to speak with you. Uh, thank you very much for sharing your perspectives and thank you all for the uh, work that you all do, the important work that you uh, all do. We are uh, pleased to partner with World Vision and SAMS to help shed light on the Syrian conflict and its cost and impact. Uh, that war is now entering its 11th year. So I encourage you to check out the podcast. It's now available at foreignpolicy.com slash podcasts. That's our website, foreignpolicy.com slash podcasts or of course, wherever you listen to podcasts. And we have already dropped two episodes. Four more are coming every Tuesday, every week for the next uh, month. And please stay tuned for much more to come from FP, including virtual dialogue uh, later this week on how to stop fake news, featuring European Commission Vice President Vera Jourova, uh, among other uh, great speakers. And next week, a conversation about the Biden administration's approach to Afghanistan and how that approach will define America's future role in the region and the US foreign policy uh, more broadly. These are all very timely. They're fascinating topics. Find out more at foreignpolicy.com events. 
We wanted to end this program with a special contribution by 13-year-old Nisreen. She is a Syrian refugee. She lives in Lebanon. Um, she appears in episode one of our podcast. Uh, she is a writer of poetry, and we're going to leave you with this poem that she wrote. So take care, and we'll see you soon. Shadows on the wall, noises down the hall. Life doesn't frighten me at all. Life doesn't frighten me at all. Bad dogs barking loud, be ghost in a cloud. Life doesn't frighten me at all. Tall guys in a fight, all alone at night. Life doesn't frighten me at all. Panthers in the park, strangers in the dark. No, they don't frighten me at all. Don't show me frogs and snakes and listen for my scream. If I'm afraid, it's only in my dream. I've got a magic charm that I keep up my sleeve. I can walk the ocean floor and never have to breathe. Life doesn't frighten me at all, not at all.